So welcome to this session on Java 8. Uh, before I start, a few words about me. Um, my name is David Labasse. Uh, despite my French accent, I'm not French. I live in Belgium, just at the France border. Um, I work at Oracle in the Java organization. Given that I work at Oracle, I have to show you the mandatory Safer Box statement slide. So you can read it. Uh, my take on this is that you shouldn't make any purchase decision based on what I will say today. Given that, there is no Java 8 application server to buy today, so it's an advice that is pretty easy to follow. Uh, nevertheless, um, we have to keep in mind that I will talk about the futures. I mean, Java 8 is something that will come uh, in the futures. So anything that I will say today in terms of uh, schedule uh, features, API, and so on, might change. So that's something you have to keep in mind. And at the end of the day, it's the GCP expert group that decide what Java E uh, will be exactly. So Java E 7 was finalized, so we had to start to work on Java E 8. Um, we have a lot of ideas on things that we would like to do in Java E 8. Um, we are looking at the market. We are seeing some trends. HTTP2, for example, is one of the trends uh, we are observing. Um, we also have a lot of discussion with the different Java E licenses uh, about things that they would like to do in Java E. We also have discussion with you. I mean, when we come to conference, if you talk to us about Java E, what is good about Java E, what is wrong about Java E, that's something that we take back internally and we give that to the uh, expert group working on Java E. So at the end of the day, we had a lot of ideas of things that we would like to do for Java E8. Now, um, when you have a list of good ideas, uh, it's sometimes useful to challenge those good ideas with a broader community. So that's what we did, we did uh, last year. Uh, we did a survey to ask the community if it was a good idea or not to uh, do such a features and so on. And also, one of the reasons we did that survey is that our wish list for Java E8 was very long. So if we wanted to do everything we had on our wish list, we won't have Java E8 for the next five, six, seven years, which is too far away. So last year we did a survey. This is the end result. I will not go into details about that. But the nice thing about that survey is that it gave us some input to start to work uh, on Java E8. If you want to have more details on the survey, just look. There is a URL at the bottom of the slide glassfish.org slash survey. You will find all the details. So that survey uh, gave us some initial input to start to work on Java E8. And from that, we have derived uh, three teams uh, of for Java E8. So as of today, Java E8 will be around HTML5 web enhancements, continue to improve ease of development so that you as a developer has to focus more on the business logic and less on the plumbing code. And finally, the third team is infrastructure for running in the cloud. So that's what I will do in the next uh, 40 minutes. I will basically try to go over those features, and I will give you an overview on where we are today uh, around that. Now, uh, clearly, there are some APIs, some area for which we have made more progress than others. So I will have more details to share. And for some APIs, I will just give you an overview, but I don't really have details, so it really depends. But at the end of the day, it will give you a sense on what Java E8 will be about. So the first team, HTML5 Web Enhancements. So we plan to do different things in that front. And when I say we, it's really the GCP expert group that is working on Java E8. It's not me personally. So uh, we plan to improve the JSON support that is uh, already in Java E8. We plan to add a new action-based MVC framework. We plan to add uh, support for server-sent event, and so on. So let's look at some of those. So the first API that will be updated in Java 8 is JSONP. So we have introduced JSONP in Java 7. In Java 8, we'll have JSONP 1.1. There are different things that the JSONP EG would like to do. For example, they would like to adopt new uh, standards that are emerging in the JSON space. They would like to make the JSONP API more Java C8 friendly. Um, they would like to tackle the notion of JSON big data. So let's look at this, some, of those some of those in more details. So the first standard I would like to do is JSON pointer. 
as the name implies, a pointer is basically a syntax that is used to reference a location within a JSON document. This is uh, an example of a pointer, so slash zero, slash phone, slash mobile. So it basically means slash zero, the first object, index zero. Then we want to have the key value pair whose key is phone, and then we want to have the key value pair whose key is mobile. So it's a pretty easy to understand standards. If we uh, put that in practice, so on the left side, I have a JSON array Java object whose representation, is, the JSON representation is on the right side. So it's basically a JSON array with two uh, users, Duke and Jane. So first, I need to define a pointer. So I new JSON pointer, then I use that specific syntax, slash zero, slash name in this case. So we are talking about the first object and then the key value pair uh, whose key is name. So we are talking about Duke. Then obviously I have this pointer, I need to do something with it. For example, pointer get value, um, and then I need to specify on which object I want to work on. So in this case, obviously, I want to work on the contacts object. So what I will get in return in this case uh, would be uh, Duke. So get value is one of the operations that will be supported, and there will also be an add replace and remove, so basically some kind of CRUDs. Uh, at the bottom of the slide, there is another example, which is um, a replace operation. So it works the same way. So we define a pointer, and then uh, on the pointer itself, we do a replace. We specify on which object we want to do the replace. And obviously, since it's a replace, we have to specify what would be the new value. Something important to notice is that the object which is returned here is a new object. Why? Because the JSONP API is an immutable API. And that is there since the 1.0, and that will not change. So the second st uh, standard that will be ad adopted in JSONP 1.1 is JSON patch. Again, the name is pretty obvious. A patch is basically a document that is used to transform another document. So this is an example of a patch at the bottom of the slide. So a JSON patch is a JSON document that will be used to transform another JSON document. In this patch, we have uh, two operations. The first one is a replace operation. We use the JSON pointer syntax again. And then, since it's a replace operation, we obviously need to specify what the new value will be. Uh, uh, so in a patch, you can have one or multiple operations. The operations are, are performed in sequence. And if one of the operations fails for whatever reason, the complete patch is aborted. So in this case, we have two operations. The first one, the replace. The second one is the remove operation. So if we look at an example, so on the left side, I have the patch. And on the right side, I have the document that I want to apply the patch to. So the first operation is the replace operation. So we are talking about uh, the object, the key value, which is slash zero phones mobile. So slash zero phone mobile. So this is basically this key value. And the operation is a replace operation. So basically, we are uh, changing that phone number. It works. So I can move on to the next operation. And the next operation is a remove operation. We want basically to get rid of that object. So that would be the end result. Now, when it comes to the Java API to use JSON patch, it will look like that. So first, we need to define a JSON patch. So this is a JSON document with one or more uh, operation. And then we just, using the patch, we just need to apply it to a specific document that we want to transform. And again, this is, a immutable uh, this is an immutable uh, API. So the result object here is a new object. We don't touch the original object. So this is JSON patch, which will be part of JSON P11. Something else that has been added is this, uh, this uh, builder-based uh, API. So you don't have to effectively grow through uh, you don't have to define a JSON patch. Um, you can directly construct dynamically the patch using this API. So uh, this is a builder API. So the first operation is an add operation. Then we re it's a remove operation. And obviously, at the end, we need to apply the patch um, to get a new uh, object. So it's basically an easy way to dynamically construct a JSON patch. Finally, the third standard that will be part of JSONP is JSON merge patch. Um, the idea is a bit similar. So uh, 
So let's look at this example. So this is the source and this is the, the end result. So this is the merge patch. So for example, the specification says that if you want to remove something from a source, you have to use a, a null. So if you look here, we have family name do. Family name, name in the merge patch is null, so that means that we won't have the family name in the uh, end result. If you want to replace something, uh, for example, the title, so you just set the new value. So the original title was goodbye, you apply this merge patch, hello, so the end result will be titled hello. So it's a fairly simple and basic uh, specification that can be used to do transformation. There are some issues with that, with, with that standard. So for example, if you have in the source a null, well, uh, something uh, won't work. But nevertheless, there are a lot of use cases where this is useful. In terms of the Java API, it, will wor it would work uh, the same way. Now we have JSON patch and JSON merge patch in the JSON P11 API. There is also uh, a diff API. So basically a patch is used to transform a document to another document, but we have this diff API that can be used to get the difference between two documents. And obviously at some point in time later, you can use the diff that is being produced to transform a document. And this is true for the JSON merge patch API and the JSON patch API. Something else that is part of uh, JSONP11 is uh, uh, it's more SE8 friendly. So this is an example of a query using streams and lambdas. Uh, there is a basic issue here. If you look at the return types here, it's a list of strings. So that means that we have done this query, but as soon as we get the result, we are outside of the JSONP API. So in JSONP11, we'll have specific uh, streams collectors to stay within the JSON API. So for example, here I'm using a JSON collector to JSON array, so that means that my return type here uh, is a JSON array. So I can continue to work using the JSON P API, which is obviously something important. So the JSON P11 EG have different ID. Um, everything is more or less done. I mean, they have already an early draft. The only thing that is not yet done is JSON Big Data. So they have just started the discussion on that point. So with JSON Big Data, the idea is that you might want to work with very large JSON document, say, for example, one gigabyte JSON document. So that's something that um, we still want to do with the API. So they are tackling that issue. So moving on on the JSON front, uh, there is JSON B, JSON binding. So basically uh, having the ability to do binding between Java object and JSON document. So JSONB is uh, to JSON what JAXB is to XML. It's exactly the same idea. So that's a new API that will be introduced in Java 8. Um, the expert group is working basically at defining the default behavior. The thing is that if you look on one side, you have the Java object model, which is very rich. I mean, uh, just look at how many ways we have to represent the dates, for example. We have many. And on the other side, we have to do the mapping, the, ma the binding uh, to the JSON object model, which is very basic. We have string numbers, object, array, boolean, and a few others. That's all. So the specification will basically define uh, the mapping between the two directions, how it should be done by default. And you, obviously, will have the ability to override that default behavior. Now, if we look at the JSON B market, it's already a very mature market. I mean, there are already a lot of solutions in that space uh, to that, that, f that are used since years. I mean, Jackson, JSON, Moxie, Fleece, JSONlib, JSON, and so on. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel and reintroduce yet a new JSONB uh, framework. What we want to do with a JSONB API is just an API that would sit on top of a JSONB framework. And you will have the ability to switch between different JSONB framework. And at the end of the day, it will be up to the JSONB framework provider to provide the capability that will make you choose their solution versus another one. So we just want to standardize the API. We don't want to introduce a new JSONB framework. So to give you some sense, the API will look like that. So um, we need to have a, a, a JSONB provider instance. So in, at the top of the slide, we get the default one, so basically the one that is provided by the reference implementation. Um, 
But obviously, you want to have the ability to switch between a JSONB provider. That's one of the value of the standardized JSONB API. That's how you would switch between a JSONB provider. And then you can do marshalling, so a Java to JSON and vice versa, and marshalling um, like this. Obviously, in your class that you will marshal and unmarshal, you will use uh, annotation to, def to, to override the default behavior which is uh, specified by the JSONB specification. So, moving on, on the web front, uh, JAXRS 2.1. So in Java 7 we have introduced Java uh, JAXRS2. Uh, it was a quite important update of the specification. For Java 8 the update around JAXRS won't be that huge. But nevertheless, the expert group has quite a few ideas that they would like to do in JAXRS21. Uh, improving the integration with CDI is one thing they would like to do. Uh, supporting JSONB. I mean, JSONB is there, so it's a no-brainer that they have to support uh, JSONB. Uh, they would like to support non-blocking I.O. providers for filters, interceptors, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I will just talk about quickly about two features that they would like to do. Um, the first one is the reactive API. So in JAXRS2, we have introduced a new client API. JAXRS21, they would like to evolve that API so that it's more, uh, re well, to evolve that API to a reactive-based approach. So this is some of the ideas that are floating around. So it's a fully reactive API, so now you can use uh, the Java IC8 new capabilities, such as the completion stage, and so on. So clearly, regarding that features, it's really the early days. So uh, some ICs are floating around. That's something that they would like to do, but it's not yet clear how it will uh, look like exactly. Something else that the JAXRS expert groups would like to do is a server sent event. So server sent events are widely used. Uh, they are part of the HTML5 specification. So it's basically a technique based on HTTP that is used to push from the server side to the client notification in an asynchronous way. So at any time, the server can send a notification to uh, a connected client. This is widely used, but as of today, there is no standard way to do that in the Java platform. So at the beginning, there were a lot of discussions about uh, where should we do that in the platform? I mean, this could be done in the servlet API, this could be done in the JAXRS API, this could be done in a completely separate API, or this could also be done in the WebSocket API. I mean, uh, SSE is not web like WebSocket, but they share some commonalities. Uh, WebSocket can be used also to push from the backend to the server some payload. WebSocket and SSE are part of HTML5, and so on. So at the end of the day, it was decided to support SSE in the JAXRS API. There are different reasons for that. One of the reasons is that it seems that SSE are often used with uh, REST services. So it makes sense to support SSE in JAXRS. Another reason was that uh, JAXRS know already how to stream uh, payload. And finally, uh, Jersey, which is the JAXRS reference, reference implementations, already support SSE in a, stand, in a proprietary way. So we know what it takes to add SSE support to a JAXRS implementation. And it turns out that it's not that uh, difficult. So this is a Jersey JAXRS code. So the API will highlightly look like that. So basically, this is just standard JAXRS uh, code. The only thing which is uh, really specific is this text event stream uh, media type, so that's the media type which is imposed by the SSE standard. And then we have this uh, event output object that we use. What we do here uh, also is we start a new thread. So that's clearly not something that you would do in a Java e container. I mean, at least you would do that using a managed thread factory. But the idea here is that I need an external thread to uh, send notification in an asynchronous way. So that's the goal of that thread. Now, if we look at the, uh, at the code of that thread, uh, so we have this have an output object, we invoke the send method, and then we pass it some payload. So at that point in time, the server will push the payload to the connected endpoints. So it's fairly easy. Now on the client side, so this is JAXRS client code. So um, we have this uh, heaven source object that we, s we set on the target of our uh, SSE endpoints. And then we have this callback that we need to implement. 
So this, this callback will be basically invoked whenever there is some uh, payload coming from the server. And what we should not forget to do is at the end we should do the we should invoke the open method on the event source object. So that's basically connection establishment, registering the callback, and so on. So you see that it's fairly easy to understand. And obviously, if you are using a JAXRS SSC uh, server and uh, endpoint, on the client side, you will have the ability to use any SSC client. So you take any HTML5 browser, and it will work again a, a JAXRS SSC server endpoint, obviously. OK, um, the next thing I would like to talk briefly is HTTP2. Uh, I guess few people in the room have attended Simon's session just before mine, just by show hand. OK, so I will not do a full-blown explanation on HTTP2. Uh, I will just highlight some of the benefits of HTTP2. Uh, I think, and it's not on my slide, the main features of HTTP2 is that it preserves all the HTTP semantics that we know today. So we still have this notion of request response. We still have uh, HTTP verbs, put, delete, get, post, and so on. We still have the notion of uh, HTTP headers, and so on. So as a developer, HTTP2 will not change a lot of, uh, for you. The big deal is really happening at the, layer, at the protocol uh, layer. So what is being effectively exchanged over the wire? So HTTP1 is a text-based protocol. HTTP2 is a binary-based protocol. In HTTP2, everything is based on binary frame. So since uh, we have binary frames, uh, that means that we can have multiple streams. A stream is basically a request response. So just think a logical connection between the client and the server. Um, in HTTP2, everything is split into frames. So in my slide, I have uh, an example of an HTTP 1.1 uh, post. So in HTTP2, that would be two frames. The first one would be the headers frames. That would include the HTTP headers. And the second frames that would be exchanged is a data frame. That includes eff effectively the payload that I want to send. But again, for you as a developer, it doesn't change anything. It's just an optimization under the hood. Um, now, the nice thing is that since the streams, so the logical uh, connection that we have with the server are broken into frames, we can have multiple streams with the server. So that effectively means that we can have multiple streams, multiple logical connections with the server over a single TCP connection. And the fact that we can have those multiple streams is really one of the big advantage. That was really one of the bottlenecks of HTTP 1.1. One of the features that is provided by HTTP2 is server push. So the ID is the following. So the server is requesting uh, a file. So in this case, the server is requesting, is requesting index.html. The server, sorry, the client is requesting index.html. The server knows that to render that file, uh, the client will need the style sheet and it will need uh, pictures. So the client will highlightly ask for those files in a very short term. So the server can decide to proactively push those resources, even though they have been, been asked yet by the client. So the server will tell the client, OK, I'm about to push you this style sheet. I'm about to push you these pictures. And obviously, the server at some point in time will also push the data which has been asked in the first place. So in this case, the index.html. So server push is really about giving the server the ability to proactively push some resources based on an incoming request. It's not a replacement for SSC. It's not a replacement for WebSocket. Uh, it's different. And as of today, there is no JavaScript API, for example, uh, for server push on the client side. So that's HTTP2. Um, we would like to add HTTP2 uh, to Java E8. That will be done in the servlet API. So one of the big deal of the servlet for API is adding support for uh, HTTP2. Now, if you look at what features need to be exposed to the developers, I mean through the API, there's not that much. For example, the fact that HTTP2 is a binary is using binary frames as a developer, you don't really mind. That's something that is fully transparent. So. Server push is clearly the only features at this stage that will be exposed through the server API. Um, this is one of the proposals floating around for the server push in the server API. It's based on the JT push builder API. So it might evolve. Uh, it's a bit early to tell what it will be, 
but that is one of the proposals that is floating around. Something else that we will do in um, Java 8 is adding a new action-based MVC framework. So today we have GSF, which is a component-based. We want to provide an alternative uh, to that. So it's not about replacing GSF. It's just, to it's just about providing more choice. And the idea with that framework is to try to leverage as much as we already have in the platform. So for the controller, it was decided to leverage JAXRS. So this is basically uh, MVC controller. And if you remove that add controller annotation, which is a new annotation that we are introducing, this is just JAXRS code. So in this case, this is a controller that whenever a user is hitting that controller, it will be sent to that view. In this case, this is a reference to a view. It's a GSP page. We can put the add controller annotation at the class or at the method levels. We can use this new add view annotation to specify what the view uh, needs to be. Uh, in this case, this is a markdown view based view. Um, we can, instead of doing that, so using the annotation or returning directly a reference to the view, we can return a viewable. It basically gives you the ability to control, to have more control on how the view should be rendered. Or we can uh, just uh, return a JAXRS response. In that case, the entity type will be a reference to the view that needs to be rendered. And again, this gives you the ability to control uh, how the view should be rendered. So in this case, we want, for example, to set the HTTP status to bad request. For the model, again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, so CDI is an obvious choice. Now, we have two ways to, reference, to define the models. Uh, whenever possible, so we would like you to use CDIs, but there are some use cases where CDI is not available. For example, you take an external template engine that is not CDI capable, then we need something else. So that's why we have this new uh, Java X MVC models interface. It's basically a fallback mechanism for the models. This is a model, uh, an MVC model. It's based, on it's based on CDI, so there's nothing new there. This is another model using the models interface based approach. So we first inject the models, then we put stuff in the models, and obviously, in our view, we'll have the ability to get uh, what has been put in the models. So you see that it's a fairly simple approach. So the view, for the view, is basically how the user interface should be rendered. Um, we already have in the platform two technologies, that is Java server pages and uh, facelets. And remember, we don't want to reinvent something. So we think that it makes sense to support those two, but we also understand that people might want to use something else. So out of the box, we support GSP and facelet, and we also have an extension mechanism that can be used to do something else than GSP and facelet. So this is a view. Uh, in this case, this is a free marker view. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention that to reference the model from the view, you just use expression language because it's already there in the platform. Again, we don't want to reinvent something. So in MVC, we have this notion of view engine. So the idea of a view engine is basically something that will render a view for a specific technologies. Obviously, we provide the GSP and facelet view engines. And you are free to implement other ones. So if you look at Ozark, which is the reference implementation for MVC, we already have implementation of those followings. And I think it's not even complete because uh, Markdown is supported, for example. So you can basically pick any templating capabilities that you want and use it uh, with MVC. And if it's not, if the technology you want to use is not there, you are free to implement your own. I mean, it's, fr it's fairly easy to do. And all of that is open source, so you can see how it has been done before. So MVC, it makes sense. It's not a replacement for GSF. It's a different approach. GSF is component-based. MVC is action-based. It's not an intrusive API, so we are just introducing four new annotations, and only one is really mandatory. That is the add controller. The other one you can uh, get around if you don't want to. So it's just really about providing you more choice. It's clearly not, uh, not about replacing GSF. GSF in Java 8 will evolve. So uh, the expert group is working on different uh, features and improvements around the GSF specification. So GSF 
is there and GSF will stay. Don't worry about that. Okay, now something else. Um, I've already talked about some contents. Um, since it's my first time in Serbia, I thought I would uh, spend one minute to teach you something about Belgium. So it's something completely different. It's the cultural break. Just one minute and then we go back. So something completely different. Uh, so 200, year, 200 years ago, uh, there was in Belgium a battle, the Battle of Waterloo. So Waterloo is basically a small place near Brussels. It was a very big battle um, where the Prussian and the British fight against the French. At the end, uh, the French lost. So since it was an important battle for the history of Europe, we in Belgium wanted to have to do something special. So. Uh, we decided to mint, so to produce a coin to celebrate the Waterloo Battle. Well, it turns out that the French were not happy with that because basically it's the most important defeat of Napoleon. It's basically the end of the Empire Napoleon, so uh, it's not something that the French are very proud. So they put their veto. I mean, at the European level, they put their veto. No, we don't want to have a, a coin that, cele that is cele celebrating the Waterloo Battle. So, we, the Belgians, were not very happy with that, so we find a loophole in the laws, in the European laws, that says that you need to have an agreement of everybody, of everybody if you want to produce a coin, except for unusual values. So what we did at the end, we, do, we did two and a half euro coins to celebrate the Waterloo battles. So, now you know why in Belgium you can't find those two and a half euro coins. It was just uh, for that. Okay, so that was something completely different. Now let's go back to the regular program. The next theme is of development. So that's not something new. I mean, since years, I mean, since Java E5, we have tried to improve the way you develop Java E application. We want to work on that, continue to work on that. Now, it's a bit difficult to explain what we do around ease of development because that's basically something that we do across the board, across all the APIs. So I just pick uh, one or two samples to give you some idea on the things that we would like to do. Uh, the first one is uh, MDB, message-driven bins. So MDBs are used to consume in an asynchronous way uh, GMS messages. So in Java E7, we have simplified the GMS API completely, but we haven't touched the MDBs, which are the most simple um, EGBs. But nevertheless, this is uh, MDBs today, so you see that it's still a bit old school. I mean, we have to use the add message driven annotation, then we have, to, we have to use the activation specs to configure the resource adapters. We have to pass this array of uh, property to configure the resource adapters. We have to implement uh, this uh, listener interface. We have to implement that method with that specific signature, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's clearly something which is a bit old school. So in GMS21, we would like to introduce what, as of now, called flexible MDBs. So flexible MDBs are still MDBs, but they are uh, meant to be easier to develop. So they are still MDBs, so we still need these add message uh, annotations. We still need to implement this interface. It's a marker interface, so this might change. But what we are doing here is that we are using this new GMS listener annotation on the method to specify that this method is uh, the callback that needs to be invoked whenever there is uh, some message coming on that specific queue. So if you compare that to that, I think you will agree that this approach uh, is more simple. And we are also thinking about uh, extending that model. So previous uh, slide was, still, so, so it was, it's still an MDB, a message even bin. But why shouldn't we try something like that? So the idea would be to let any uh, managed bins consume a payload coming from a GMS queue. So this is not an MDB anymore. This is a pure uh, managed bin. We have the, this, uh, the same annotation at GMS queue listener. And that, MD, that method will be invoked whenever there is some payload coming in. So we are not replacing MDBs. We want to simplify MDB by introducing flexible MDBs. 
but we, maybe we also want to go to that models. And there are pros and cons why you want to do one versus the other one. For example, the way transactions are managed in, us, in this approach is different than in MDBs. MDBs are pulled, CDI bins are not pulled, and so on. So there are differences, there are pros and cons, but why not provide the two? So this is something that has been discussed within the expert groups. So moving on, regarding simplification, it would be unfair to talk about simplification without uh, discussing uh, CDI, context and dependency injection. Because CDI is really the key technology that we have used through the years to simplify uh, how we develop Java E application. So the CDI expert group has different things in mind for CDI2. The first one is modularity. So if you look today, CDI, it's already a quite uh, large specification, which is okay, but when it comes to environments such as uh, Java C, it might be an issue. So if you want to use CDI in Java C, you have to take everything. It's a whole or nothing approach. So what they have in mind with CDI2 is to try to split the specification in two, having a CDI SC version, and then based on that, they would have a CDI EE version. And obviously, that would help the adoption of CDI outside of the Java EE ecosystems. Something else they have in mind is to standardize how they can bootstrap in a standard way a CDI container. Something else for CDI 2 is uh, asynchronous event. So right now, I mean, since CDI 1.0, there is an event-based mechanism that is used to... It's basically an implementation of the producer-consumer patterns. So this is how it works. So on one side, we have a producer, and on the other side, we have a consumer. This is the producing side, so we inject an event of some type, and then at some point in type, we invoke the fire method on that uh, event type and that will fire an event. On the consuming side, we have this. So we have a method, and to specify that the method needs to be invoked whenever that guy is firing an event, we just need to use the at observes annotation, and uh, that observer will be invoked. So we can have one or multiple observers, but the thing is that the observer will be invoked in the same thread. So it's a fully synchronous uh, approach. For CDI2, they would, they would like to add asynchronous capabilities. So it would work like that. So instead of firing, we do a fire and async. What we get in return is a completion stage of Java AC8. So this is the producing side. On the other side, on the consuming side, we would still have a specific annotation that we will use to specify what the async observer will be. So, at observe async, uh, this is an async observer. And obviously, uh, so, the, the call of that observer would be done in a different thread, so it's fully asynchronous. And obviously, I can then use the completion stage that I get here, for example, to get uh, the result from my observers or to get the exception that have been produced by the observers and so on, those kind of things. So this is something uh, which will be added to CDI2. Something else in CDI2 is about adding the ability to define in which order the sync observer should be invoked. So today, if you have multiple observers, so first of all, they are synchronous, obviously, and today, we don't have any way to specify uh, the order in which, in, in which uh, they have to be invoked. So it's completely uh, implementation dependent. So it's, at best, it's a guess that you have to do. So the CDI AG would like to improve that. So they would like to use the add priority annotation to basically some kind of priority weight. So for example, in this example, I'm telling the container that since I have a priority one, this one should be invoked first in the chain. And that one has a lower priority, so, so it should be uh, invoked uh, later on. So that's something that the CDIEG uh, would like to do. Pruning. So if you look at the Java platform over the years, we have added capabilities, uh, but we have never removed anything. So at some point in time, we decided that maybe it would be time to remove stuff 
that are not necessarily used anymore or that have been replaced by other technologies uh, in a more modern ways. So this is what pruning is about. Pruning is basically a simple and elegant way to tell users that we are thinking about removing stuff from the platform. So it's a phased approach. So we basically first put a flag on the platform to say that, on an API, sorry, to say that, okay, this API uh, looks old, so it might be removed in the future. So if you can, uh, avoid to use it. In the next version, uh, we put another flag say, saying that this API is now optional, so now you sh it's really a time uh, to look at something else. And then, obviously, in the next version, we remove it. So people have been warned. I mean, they have several years to move away uh, from those old technologies. So part of the simplification effort we want to do for Java E is also remove some of the old stuff which are not used anymore. So for example, in Java 8, we might want to uh, mark Corba as optional, those kind of things. So this has still to be decided by the Java 8 expert group. But we want to continue to work on that effort. So that was a very short overview of ease of development. Now, let's talk about the final team, which is infrastructure for running in the cloud. Um, this team is not about defining a cloud-enabled version of Java E. It's really about uh, improving some of the capabilities of the platform so that Java E can be used in a more elegant way in closed-based environment. And at the, at the end of the day, those new features, those new capabilities will also be something that you will highly likely leverage in more traditional on-premises uh, deployment. So, um, at this stage, there are two uh, GSR, so two Java specification requests regarding that team. The first one is Java e management 2.0. So if you look at uh, the platform, we have a very old GSR. Uh, we see GSR 77, uh, G2e management. You can just tell by the number, by looking at the number 77. I mean, now we are in the 360 range. So it's a 12, 14 years old GSR. It's a very old, uh, very old stuff. But the idea is to take some of those con the concepts that are in that GSR. So basically, it explains how to manage in a standard way a Java e containers and revamp those, put th those concepts in a more modern way. For example, it would be nice if we can add a REST interface on top of that so that you can easily manage a Java e container using a REST uh, interface. And for example, if we would have REST capabilities, and in Java E, uh, REST will be SSE enabled, we can then imagine the container to push notification through a management platform using SSE, those kind of things. So those are some of the ID of that expert group. Uh, for that expert group, it's really the early days, so they haven't made a lot of progress yet, so it's a bit hard to exactly uh, give more details at this stage. Now. Moving on, there's another G new GSR, which is called Java eSecurity, uh, GSR 375, I think. Um, they have a huge task, because if we look at the Java e platform, I mean, we have security concept across the platform. But the thing is that uh, there are some gaps between uh, all those different uh, security concerns, uh, sorry, security uh, features. So when it comes to uh, deploying a secure application, you sometimes have to use uh, application server specific features or use third party uh, library and so on. At the end of the day, this really uh, reduce the portability of the application. So that's something that, that, GS, that GSR would like to improve. How we can make sure that we can uh, write and deploy uh, in a standard way application with all the security capability that are required today. So, for example, one of the things they would like to do is to add uh, the concept of identity, st identity store. Today, there is no standard way in the specification to manage users. So, that's something that they would like to address. To address. So, for example, the, in these slides, we inject an identity, identity store. It could be an LDAP store, it could be a JSON file store, it could be a memory uh, store for development, and so on. Then we use this credential object. Um, in this case, it's a username password credential, but it could be a token-based credential, it could be a certificate-based credential, and so on. And we use that basically to validate the users. So uh, is, 
is the authentication of that user really valid? If yes, we can then uh, get and fetch uh, attributes of that users, and so on. So today you can already do that. The thing is that sometimes you have to pick here and there's capability uh, outside of the platform to achieve that goal. We would like to standardize that. Something else that, that GSR would like to do is uh, the notion of CDI interceptors. So the idea is that you will use CDI annotation to basically protect your code. And obviously, that interceptors will need to have visibility on the domain uh, application it's running in. So for, for example, this method, transfer funds, uh, well, you can only transfer funds if you, have, if you are a manager, and you can only do that during uh, office hours. Another example, get the salary of an employee. You can only do that if you're a manager, and if that particular employee is one of your direct reports. Those kind of things. And something else that they are also thinking is about adding the ability to externalize those rules in a rule stores, let's call it like that, so that you can easily re uh, reuse across your application and your deployment those rules. So this is some of the things that, that GSR is working on. Um, REST authentication is something they have in mind. Password aliasing is also something else that they have in mind. So it's not exactly clear what will be there for the 1.0 uh, version. But uh, well, we'll have to wait and see. So quick recap, three teams for Java 8, uh, HTML5 web enhancements, ease of development, and infrastructure for running in the cloud. And something important is that whatever we do, so whenever we touch an API in Java 8, we have to make sure that we try to leverage Java AC8, because Java 8 will only run on top of Java AC8 and more. So if you haven't moved yet to Java AC8, now it's a good time. So today, we have 11 GSR, so 11 specification which has been formally started, so there is an expert group working on, well, there are 11 expert groups working on the specification. The one in red are the ones which are already in early draft. So you can already download the specification, you can download the reference implementation, play with it, and so on. We expect to have a more uh, update following. For example, IBM, which is driving GSR 3.5.2, so the batch API for the Java platform, uh, they have announced that they will. They are kicking start. They are kickstarting. Sorry, the batch API 1.1 uh, effort. Uh, Bin validation. The spec lead has, told, has said that they are thinking about doing a bin validation 2.0, and so on. So really, today it's just the beginning uh, of that. In terms of roadmap, um, we would like to have. Um, well, we would like to be in early draft Q3 uh, 2015, which is now. So, uh, not everything is there yet. But the idea is that we would like to be a final release by the first half of 2017. Now, you can help us. You can either join the GCP. So, if you think that, for example, you have good knowledge of HTTP2, it might be useful that you join the Servlet4 expert group. But it takes a lot of time. So if you don't have that time, another way of helping us to shape Java 8 is adopt a GSR. So the idea is that we ask, exper uh, we ask uh, JUG, Java user group, to adopt a GSR. So you take a GSR, you write sample for that GSR, you try to break the reference implementation, you provide us feedbacks on what is good about the API, what is wrong, what needs to be fixed, and so on. We still have time. So uh, if something's wrong, we need to know it now. With that, uh, I hope it's okay. It's, yeah? Okay. So, oh yeah. Is there any question on the slides? So no current questions. Oh. If any quick questions, go ahead or... OK, so um, any questions or remarks in the audience?
No? Well, c can we go back to the slide then? Yeah. Yes. What, what is what? The, which? Uh, stateless? The status of which? GSF? The status? Yeah. So, uh, well, as I told you, uh, so uh, uh, for Java 1, so in three weeks from now, we'll have an early draft of the GSF update. So, uh, for example, in, G in the update, they have improved the CDI uh, integration. So now you can inject a lot of, using CDI, you can inject a lot of the uh, CDI artifact, those kind of things. So clearly, if GSF is there and GSF will remain. So we continue to work on GSF. You shouldn't worry about that. Okay, well, if we can go back to the slides. So this is a picture that uh, was taken at a conference uh, earlier this week. So if there is more, no more questions, I will leave you with that one. I have to talk about microservices. I mean, every presentation is talking about microservices. So the takeaway is that, uh, well, microservices, there are a lot of good ideas, but maybe the reality is in between. So, and I think that slide summarizes that very well. And if you have more questions or more feedback, I will be here uh, until tomorrow afternoon. So just come to me. Thank you.